Canal Region Chamber. We primarily cover the communities of Bourne, Sandwich, and Wareham. We're happy to <coughs> provide this forum, and I want to thank Dan for helping us out um, from the SBA. And uh, thank you to you, Pam and Rick, for uh, helping to sponsor this. We've got good participation, and we hope uh, everyone can gain some knowledge from this. Thank you so much. And good morning, everybody. I'm Rick Kidder. I want to thank you. I want to thank Cranberry Country Chamber and Cape Cod Region Chamber for letting us, Cape Cod Canal Region Chamber for letting us piggyback onto this. Um, this is uh, important stuff for our restaurants, and we're very, very pleased to uh, to be a part of it this morning. Other than that, I will leave it to the brilliant people. Okay, so Dan um, Martinello is going to present for us um, today, and I want to thank you, Dan, for uh, reaching out to us. And welcome and thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and thanks for all three chambers to have me on. You know, we're gonna go over a lot of different information today on the RRF and hopefully most folks have already, you know, applied for this at this point. But um, if you haven't, you definitely wanna make sure that you get your application in, you know, sooner rather than later. But I'm gonna provide you all sorts of details about eligibility, calculations and, and other things you need to know about the program. So. We'll get right into it. Let me just minimize my video here. Okay. <clears throat> oh, you know what? Uh, another thing that I, too, I, I was talking to uh, Pam before the presentation. I just want to provide you some, you know, just news about uh, SBA uh, programs and services that we just, you know, got the official word of this morning because I know this is important to a lot of folks that are listening to this. So the Paycheck Protection Program, um, as of this morning, uh, the funds have been exhausted from that, that program. So uh, lenders will not be able to uh, accept uh, new applications at this time. However, there are a couple um, CFIs in Massachusetts that should be able to still accept um, um, applications uh, based on appropriations being set aside for that purpose. Uh, right now, we're in our office is in the process of making sure that and finding out if the few CFIs that we have here in the state are accepting applications because, you know, we don't want to disperse that uh, info out to the public if they're no longer accepting the applications. But we will provide more details probably later on uh, today. I'll make sure that, you know, the chambers get that. And if you want to, you know, disperse that to small businesses that may have not of um, applied for, for PPP. I know the, the funding itself or the application period itself was supposed to be extended um, up until the end of this month, but uh, with the appropriations running out, uh, um, you know, that's, that's gonna stop um, for most lending partners. Uh, another thing to note, what we know of right now is if your application um, is still in process from my understanding that funds were appropriated for applications that were that were in the queue um you know but we're gonna again we're gonna find out more information on that to make sure um you completely understand whether if you had a pending application or not if that's um still gonna go through and, and get uh the final funding uh for that particular um, program also too with the shuttered venue operator grant um program because i know some folks that um you may have be looking at the RRF and you also, you, you know, you were also looking at the shuttered venue operator um, uh, grant program, you know, that did have some, you know, issues when it first rolled out a few weeks back. Um, however, the application portal is up and running as of last Monday. Uh, you know, with that said, we um, just got a rough estimate of how many applications uh, were submitted within the last week. And I think nationwide, there has been about uh, 13,000 applications for the SVOG. Um, so that is up and running. So, you know, th this is some of the things, you know, depending on the type of business entity, you're going to want to outweigh your options on whether the RRF is more beneficial for you or the SVOG is more beneficial for you. So um, I'll detail that in these uh, next few slides. So what is the, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund? So this is the newest grant program that was established under the American Rescue Plan Act, um, which became law back in uh, the middle of March. So this grant program has $28.6 billion um, in funding, you know, um, in award funding. So 
appropriations for this is going to remain available until expended. So there's not a specific uh, uh, deadline for when you can apply. It's just gonna, you know, once the funds are exhausted, that's when the uh, application deadline will, will stop. Um, and, and then what well, you got to find out too with this program, you know, unlike PPP where you, you know, only had up to 24 weeks to utilize your funds and, you know, that was your given covered period. With this program, you'll, you'll actually be able to use the funds up until March 11th of 2023. So, you know, it extends the time frame that you can, you, you know, um, make use of those funds. So who's eligible for the RRF fund? And I, you know, I always tend to try to go to the acronyms and instead of saying restaurant revitalization fund over and over, because it just becomes a, a tongue twister, you know, trying to keep up with all of these different programs and services we're offering now. Uh, so the eligible uh, entities are going to be businesses that are not permanently closed and include businesses where the public or patrons assemble for the primary purpose of being served food or drink. <clears throat> so with that said, that's going to include, you know, your restaurants, your food stands, food trucks, food carts, uh, caterers, bars, um, uh, saloons, lounges, taverns, um, you know, your snack and non-alcoholic beverage bars bakeries, uh, brew pubs, you know, you can see the list goes, goes on and on, wineries, inns. Um, what you'll notice here though, you know, this program is not for an entity that may, might fit this, uh, you know, list below that's considered a wholesaler. So, you know, if you are a brewery, you have to show um, a, at least 33% of your gross receipts come from on-site sales to the public. Okay, so, you know, same thing goes for, for inns and winery and distilleries, as you can see here on this slide. Another thing too, I just wanna, you know, make mention of, when we're talking about permanently closed, you know, I know we, we may be talking to a few folks here, you know, in the Cape, you, you are seasonal based, restaurant or your seasonal based entity that's eligible for this program. So maybe you're closed during the winter time. That is perfectly fine. You know, when we're talking permanently closed, we're talking you turned in your keys, you no longer lease your location or, you, you know, you do not operate at all. You don't uh, accept customers in your door. You're completely closed um, and you have no uh, commitment to try to reopen your establishment. So who is ineligible? Uh, so the entities you see here are gonna be ineligible for this program. So state or local government um, operated businesses, um, as of March 13th, 2020, um, businesses that own or operate um, together with any affiliated business, more than 20 locations. So that's gonna be regardless of whether those locations do business under the same or different names or are, un or are in different industries. Um, or if you have a pending application or have received a shuttered venue operators grant. So like I said earlier, you know, you, you may be an entity that could potentially uh, um, fit the eligibility for both of these programs. But with that said, you're going to have to make that business decision on which program would be best for you to apply for. Um, then if you're a publicly traded company, um, again, if you're permanently closed, um, if you're a nonprofit organization, and uh, when it comes down to the calculations, so that I'll go over um, later on in this presentation, if your funding ends up being less than $1,000, um, the, the application will automatically be denied. It won't be considered eligible. So they're only giving out awards for, for um, uh, funding of more than $1,000. So uh, the, how much can you be eligible for? So the SBA may provide funding of up to $5 million per location. So which is not going to exceed $10 million total for the applicant and any affiliated businesses. And again, the minimum award is gonna be $1,000. So how is this program different from other SBA programs? You know, so unlike say the, the um, SVOG, you know, there was a process where you had to register for SAM.gov and you were required to have a, a DUNS or a CAGE identifier. With this program, there is no, you know, added verification. There's no added registration that you have to um, do, on, you know, on, on SAM.gov or provide additional DUNS or CAGE numbers. So that is not needed under this program. Also, too, if you have a valid unexpired ITINs, uh, they are acceptable uh, within this program as well.
So what forms of organization are, are, are eligible? So as you can see here on the list, the majority of business um, forms of organization are eligible um, you know, under this RRF fund. Um, so, you know, you have your C-Corps, your S-Corps, partnerships, you know, your limited liability companies, sole proprietors, self-employed individuals, independent contractors, tribal businesses, and uh, LLCs taxed as an S-Corp or a sole, uh, sole prop. So, you, you know, uh, the majority of forms of organizations are going to be, um, you know, eligible, you know, within this funding program. Franchises as well, they're also eligible um, under this program. So any business concern operating as a franchise and meeting all other program requirements is eligible. So the franchise must be listed in SBA's franchise directory. So in the application portal, the applicants will be able to look up their entity in the SBA franchise directory. Okay, so when you're actually doing your application, if you haven't done that, and this is something that applies to you, maybe you own a, uh, you, you know, you're an owner of a, of a, of a franchise, you know, the, the directory itself has, I think, more than 4,000 franchises listed. So, you know, if, if worst case scenario, a franchise is not listed, um, the, the, you want to make sure you connect with the franchisor and they can provide information to get uh, added as a brand onto the franchise uh, directory. So uh, additional information when it comes to eligibility, when, I, uh, when we're talking about bankruptcies, <clears throat> So here, as you can see on the slide, you have applicants um, that are that are operating under an approved plan of reorganization under either a Chapter 11, uh, 12, or 13 bankruptcy and meet all program requirements are eligible for funding. Um, when they're not eligible, it would be if they're permanently closed, uh, if they filed a Chapter 7 liquidation bankruptcy, or if they filed a Chapter 7, 11, 12, or 13 bankruptcy, um, but is not under an approved plan of reorganization. So that, that's going to be the key. If you, if, you, if you did file that bankruptcy, you have to have an approved plan already in place. Uh, permanently closed does not include businesses who also temporarily close their doors due to state or local restrictions or other pandemic causes, but are still in operation or have reopened. So yeah, if you had an outbreak, maybe uh, someone you know on your staff had you, you know um, got COVID, and for safety precautions, you know of your the rest of your staff and, and your your patrons, you know you had to shut down for a period of time. That's not considered you know closing um, or any any other time during the pandemic where the state or the local officials mandated that your operation close. You know that's not considered a temporary uh, or, or a permanent closure. So um, how do other SBA relief programs impact the RRF? So when it comes to the Paycheck Protection um, Program, PPP, um, you, you're going to see this uh, in the few upcoming slides of that it's going to be factored into each calculation when it comes to finding out how much uh, grant funding you could possibly be awarded. So any funds already received through the Paycheck Protection Program will be subtracted from the applicant's final funding amount. Uh, the applicant is verified using uh, the EIN, the ITIN, or the SSN associated with its PPP loans. Okay, so if the applicant received a PPP loan, the applicant must use the same EIN number for its RRF application as it used in its PPP application. So just, you know, be aware of that when you are applying for the RRF that you want to, you know, make sure that if you did apply for, or if you did receive PPP funding that you're utilizing the same EINs because the system itself, when you're applying, will match up and identify what funds have been appropriated for your particular entity. Uh, if the applicant applied for a first job PPP loan from multiple locations under one EIN and subsequently applied for a second draw PPP loan under different EINs, the applicant must provide those EINs for each entity that received second draw PPP loans. Um, upon applying for the RRF, the applicant must withdraw any outstanding PPP application. As you know, I discussed earlier, um, but you know, for the most part, you know, other than a few instances, you know, PPP PPP funds have been exhausted. So um, you're not going to be able to, you know, submit a new application uh, going forward. However, you know, prior, if you did have a pending application, you sh um, you should have talked to your lender about, you know, making sure that they um, remove that if it hasn't been finally approved yet. 
uh, the applicant must not have a pending application for or have received a shuttered venue operator grant from the SBA. So, you know, when it comes to the SBOG, it's in the RRF, it's one or the other. You can't apply for both. So there's going to be some things uh, typical that, that you, you would see on some of these other COVID-19 small business relief programs about certifications, you know, for, you know, for your entity and for your business. So as you see here, all, applica all, all applicants must certify that current economic uncertainty makes the funding request necessary to support ongoing or anticipated operations. And that's very similar to, you know, what some of our other uh, COVID-19 relief programs ask. It's, it's very similar uh, certifications and, 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 you know, attesting to that. So how can you utilize the funds under this program? What's, what's considered eligible use of funds? Um, so as you can see here, uh, that you know, we, we have a slide with the list. We also have a program guide that's listed on our on SBA.gov. We have a, a landing page specifically for the RRF fund, which you'll be able to see a sample application on there. They even have screenshots of the online version of the application and the process there. So, you know, if you need help, you know, identifying what information you, you need to input in certain sections, you can utilize that tool as well. Um, they have a program guide that's about 20 to 25 pages long that provides you uh, specific details on the program, provides you definitions of different things and, and a more extensive list on the eligible use of funds. I'll make sure that um, all the chambers have that information at the end of the presentation, along with this uh, presentation itself. So you, um, everybody will get that dispersed to them and have all the necessary tools uh, moving forward. So when it comes to expenses, you, you'll see here, you have business expenses such as you know, payroll costs. So similar to, you know, PPP, you can utilize this fund for, for payroll costs, you know, just, you know, there's not going to be this, you know, like PPP, how you had to utilize a certain percentage. So upwards of 60% of uh, the funds on payroll costs to be eligible for full, for full forgiveness. Whereas this program, there's no, you know, certain percentage of how you utilize the funds. It's either you just utilize them for eligible um, um, uh, business expenses, or you don't. So there's not, you're not going to be any tracking on, on the percentage of things. So when it comes to, to that, you can, you know, even include sick leave, you have business utility payments, uh, business maintenance expenses, business supplies, uh, business food and beverage expenses, covered supplier costs, um, business operating expenses. So that can include your insurances, uh, marketing fees, uh, licenses, you know, you know, legal fees, uh, point of sale equipment. So, uh, you know, a, a, a whole host of things. And then uh, also too, you have construction expenses, right? So you have, you, you know, there might've been a lot of small businesses, you know, in, in the, you know, food and service industry that may have had to have, um, um, built outdoor seating due to all the health and safety restrictions and, and put in place. Um, so if you, if that's something that you may have paid for over the last year, you, you can, you know, recoup funds for that as well. Uh, what's not going to be what these funds cannot be used for is, um, you know, for expansion. So if you're looking to open up a second location, um, and then you want to utilize the funds to outfit that entire location, you know, that's not, you know, uh, what these funds, um, are eligible to be used for. Uh, so also to business debt. So payments on any um, business mortgage obligation. So just keep in mind, you can't pay any, make any prepayments of principal or interest. Also to business uh, debt service. Uh, again, no prepayments on principal and interest. So you can pay if you have an SBA loan or an uh, economic injury disaster loan, or, you know, um, you, you know, you can utilize funds to pay that. If you have another small business loan, you know, out there with, with, with a lender, maybe you have a line of credit, you, you know, you can utilize the funds to pay your monthly uh, payments. So how long again, do you have to utilize the funds? So, you know, as, as I told everybody in the beginning, you have up until March 11th, 2023 um, to utilize these funds, but you can also utilize these uh, funds for expenses that were incurred going all the way back uh, to February 15th of 2020. Okay, so, um, you know, maybe you have back rent, you know, uh, things like that, y you can utilize these funds to pay that, that back rent. 
Uh, if the business permanently closes after receiving the funds, the covered period will end when the business permanently closes or on March 11th, uh, 2023, whichever occurs sooner. And then um, what's gonna happen, any funds not spent on eligible expenses by the time the covered period ends must be returned to the government. So, you know, the SBA will work on guidance on that um, probably later on in the coming weeks, you know, as far, you know, as far as that goes. So if, you know, for whatever reason you weren't able to utilize those funds, there'll be a method to, you know, send that back uh, to Uncle Sam. So, um, I, you know, just some continued information when it comes to utilizing the funds. So um, there's going to be a use of funds assessment. So after the total awarded funds have been exhausted, um, entities must provide a detailed uh, expenditure report and certification for the uh, required period. Um, until ap the applicant completes the use of funds assessment beginning on um, December of 2021, applicants are required to provide self-reported unaudited data detailing use of distributed funds each year through 2023. So SBA will be providing additional guidance uh, that outlines that, that detailed reporting requirements and procedures, you know, in the next few weeks as well. So, you know, just keep in mind, you are going to need to keep track of how you spend um, these funds. You're not asking for forgiveness, such as like the PPP program would would require. However, the S, you know, the SBA and, and you know the government in general, and con you know, with Congress, they want to make sure that this program in itself is is trying to uphold the integrity, uh, you know, of the the funds that are being utilized as uh, taxpayer money. So, you know, we want to make sure that you know these funds are being utilized for the correct purposes and you know to help you know your business stay in operation. So, um, you know, the next few slides we're going over here, we're going to, we're going to, you're going to see that um, there's various calculations um, when it comes to finding out how much funds you can be awarded under this program. Um, so what you're going to find out is you're going to use the application based on uh, the calculation based on uh, when you started your operation. So what the SBA for this program considers when you started your operation is when you made your first sale to a customer, okay? So it's not when you were assigned your uh, business tax ID. It was not when you registered with the Secretary of State. You know, it was, you know, when did you um, make your first sale to a customer? So for calculation one, the applicants uh, these are for applicants in operation prior to or on January 1st of 2019. What you're going to do here is you're going to take your 2019 gross receipts, you're going to minus out your uh, 2020 gross receipts, and then minus out PP, uh, any PPP loan amounts you received, whether it's just a first draw uh, or a first and second draw, whether you have applied for forgiveness or not applied for forgiveness, or whether you have used all the funds of your PPP loan or not, you have to factor in your PPP loan amounts that you were awarded into this calculation. So um, when it comes to calculation two, these are gonna be for applicants that began operations partially through 2019. So, what you're going to do here is you're going to take your average 2019 monthly gross receipts, you'll times it by 12, then you'll minus your 2020 gross receipts, and then minus your PPP loan amounts. Keep in mind, you know, so that, you know, for a couple of things you want to um, keep in mind with, with this particular calculation. Um, let's say you started um, your operation on October 1st of 2019. So what's that, what that's saying is you had three months worth of operation. So if your gross receipts at the end of 2019 said $30,000, what you'll first do is divide that amount by the three months you were in operation and then times it by 12 and finish the rest of the calculation. The program also dictates that you prorate um, um, the, ma the math based on when you at what time frame in the month you actually did start. So let's say you didn't start at the beginning of the month. Say you started October 15th. What you'll then do is take that year end 2019 gross receipts and divide it by 2.5 instead because you started halfway through October 
um, instead of on October 1st. So, you know, um, they want to, you, you know, you know, count a full month if you are in operation in full, um, full month, but prorate it if you are not in operation for that full month. Uh, also, too, you'll notice that folks that can utilize calculation two will also be able to utilize calculation three if that best fits their, their need. However, you're going to find out in these next few slides that calculation three will require longer processing times, and I will explain it right now. Uh, so calculation uh, three. This is going to be for applicants that began operations on or between January 1st, 2020 and March uh, 10th of 2021, and the applicants not yet opened, but have incurred eligible expenses as of March 11th, 2021. So let, let that you know sit for a second, right? So this is a little bit different than, say, the Paycheck Protection Program, where you had to be in operation um, and, and, and have had incurred payroll on or before February 15th of 2020. This program allows a lot of other folks to apply because basically you, you may not have be in operation yet and you can in a, in apply, but if you've incurred expenses along the way and you know due to COVID you've had you know issues you know getting your business started and, 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 and operated, you can apply for this this program. So what you're going to do for this calculation is you're going to take the total amount spent on eligible expenses between February 15th of 2020 and March 11th of 2021. Then if applicable, you're going to minus out your 2020 and 2021 gross receipts and then minus out um, any PPP loan amounts you, you received if that's applicable. I'm assuming a lot of folks in this case may not have received PPP loan amounts because they may not have been in operation in enough time to be eligible. Um, but with that said, what's considered eligible expenses under this calculation? Well, it's the same eligible expenses that I discussed when it came to you, how you can utilize those funds. So all of those types of expenses can be used to, to factor in, uh, in this calculation. Keep in mind, this is why processing times will be longer because the RRF re review team is going to need to review your supporting documentation and figure out, you know, what those, you know, make sure and determine if those um, expenses that you submitted for that particular calculation are in fact eligible. So you're going to need to provide, you know, supporting documentation. Let's say you're, uh, you're adding in the expenses for your outdoor seating that you had, you, you installed, you know, you'll need to provide, you know, invoices and, and payments for that. Uh, maybe you're adding in payroll, uh, you know, expenses for that. So, you know, you might need to provide, you know, 941s, things like that uh, to, to support uh, that calculation. So what can you exclude from 2020 um, gross receipts? So, um, you know, here's the list of the following things that you, you can exclude from your 2020 gross receipts when you're factoring in uh, that for your calculation purposes. So the Paycheck Protection Program, first or second draw loans can be excluded. As, as we've already discussed, that's going to be factored into each calculation on its own. Um, and then if you... Uh, currently have an SBA loan, you know, with, with one of our lending partners, you may have been, uh, you, you may be familiar with the SBA helping out with principal and interest payments over a given period of time over the last year. Uh, those were, you know, uh, called, you know, uh, Section 1112 CARES Act payments. Um, if you, if you receive those payments because you had a prior SBA loan, you know, then you want to make sure you exclude that from your 2020 uh, gross receipts as well. Then if you received an economic injury disaster loan, so the EIDL loan that you, you may have heard um, you know, advertised, if you also received your EIDL advance, or some people called it an EIDL grant, um, if you received a targeted EIDL advance or any other grant funds received via the CARES Act, exclude that from your 2020 gross receipts. Also, too, at a more local level, you may have received state or local uh, business grants during, during uh, you know, the, this you know, pandemic you can exclude that from your, your uh, 2020 gross receipts. And then uh, any, any funding under the Randolph uh, Shepard Act financial relief and restoration payments appropriation, exclude that as well. So how do you apply? 
So there's going to be a couple methods and, you know, it's just going to be, you know, preference on what's, what's going to, you know, make life easier for, for you as a, as a small business. So uh, one way is you can apply directly through the SBA platform, which is at uh, restaurants.sba.gov. So the portal for applications uh, has opened up as of noontime this past Monday. So if you have not applied yet, you can go on right now and do it. Um, also, too, there's a few point of sale vendors uh, that have partnered with the SBA that are actually accepting applications on their own portals for their customers or clients' behalf. So, if you're working, if you have, if you're a customer of Toast, um, and I think also Square, if I'm not mistaken, they both have their own portals for this particular program that you can submit an application through there as well. So, um, you want to connect with them. They may have, uh, um, I'm assuming they may have uh, sent out, you know, some sort of mass email to their uh, clients, letting them know that. But if not, you know, you can connect with them. They, they do have uh, uh, applications up and that can be submitted through their uh, sites. Also too, um, you can apply over the phone with a representative that works um, on the RRF program. Um, so you can call the RRF hotline at 844-279-8898. You know, just expect that, you know, it's gonna take longer to process if you do that, utilize that method. And you're probably gonna deal with long wait times because this hotline is also a general hotline for everybody that's, you know, having technical issues, you know, trying to submit their applications online. It's also used for general eligibility questions and, and concerns, things like that. Um, you know, or, you know, just questions on, you know, what supporting documentations they need and all, all of that under the sun. So, you know, keep in mind that that's going to be your longest processing time if you choose that method. So what documents are you going to need in order to apply? So this is just a basic rundown. And then in the next few slides, we'll go over more specific based on the calculation you um, are utilizing. So Everybody, doesn't matter what calculation they're utilizing, doesn't matter when they started their operation or haven't started their operation, you're going to need to fill out SBA Form 3172. That is the application for this uh, particular program. You're going to need to complete it, initial, and sign. And then just keep in mind, we're anticipating the majority of folks uh, doing this digitally, whether it's on our platform or a third-party vendor that's, that's offering this as well. Um, you know, so... So, you know, doing this digitally will satisfy any, you know, initials and signing requirements. Also, too, everybody's going to need to fill out a, a verification of tax information. So IRS Form 4506T completed and signed by the applicant. Again, if you're doing it digitally, that will satisfy uh, the requirement. Uh, then for gross receipts documentation, so any of the following documents demonstrating gross receipts and if applicable eligible expenses, so that will come down to if, if you're using uh, calculation three for the expenses. So you're going to need to provide tax returns. So depending on, you know, how what your business uh, organization is and how they file taxes, you know, you may, be, you know, utilize um, IRS form 1120 or maybe, um, you know, you use IRS form uh, 1040 Schedule C, whatever the case may be, however your entity files, you want to make sure that you provide the SBA your full tax return, not just the front page of the tax return. They want the full federal tax return with any schedules included. Uh, also, too, you're going to need to provide the SBA bank statements. They're going to want to see your most recent three months of bank statements. You know, I understand people's bank statements are cut at a variety of times of the month. Just make sure you're just getting your most three recent. If, if you don't have one for, you know, leading up to your application period, that's fine because, you know, like, like I said, I know I come from a banking background. Everybody's statements are cut at different time periods, sometimes depending on their last name or, or when they open their account. Um, but it's, and when it comes to the bank statements, the SBA is not looking for your bank statements for the purpose to find out how much money you have and you know do you really need these funds that's not the purpose of requesting the bank statements the purpose is to make sure the integrity you know making sure we're matching up the uh, the funds to the proper account to the proper entity um so we're, we're you know they're trying to reduce any sort of fraud issues or making sure that the, the business entity applying is actually utilizing it um, and it's the money's being sent to 
an account that they typically use for business purposes. Um, it's not going to someone's personal account or anything like that. So that's really, you know, they're just trying to uphold the integrity uh, of this particular program. And then depending on your situation, you may need to provide externally or internally prepared financial statements, such as income statements or profit and loss statements. Um, and then also you, can, um, you should be able to get uh, point of sale reports, um, including IRS form uh, 1099Ks, you know, if applicable. So, you know, that, that's something too that you'll find out in these next few slides that I'll go over. You may supply that as, as a preferred method when um, looking at your 2020 uh, gross receipts. So one thing to keep in mind with that, you know, I know I talked about how Toast and Square are actually providing uh, their clients to apply uh, for this program through them. They're also uh, providing the supporting documentation necessary, so the, the, the point of sale reports. Uh, keep in mind, though, there's a variety of other um, point of sale vendors that, although they may not be um, allowing for an application to be submitted through their own uh, website or, or portal, they are helping their customers with any sort of point of sale reports they meet, may need and other, um, you know, assistance, you know, in that matter, gathering documents for this particular program. So I know like Clover and uh, NCR was one, there's a few others, um, you know, so you want to check with your point of sale vendor if you don't have uh, the proper reports and, you know, and ask them to supply that to you as soon as possible. Uh, so for calculations one and two, you know, like I said, this is more of a, a specific breakdown of what supporting documentations will need to be required. But like I said earlier, everybody's filling out an application, right? So everybody's gonna be um, filling out a tax verification form. Again, I'm assuming most folks are gonna be doing this, you know, whether, you know, on online in some form or fashion. Um, and then when it comes to your 2019 gross receipts, you wanna provide your full, tax returns, not just the first page. Those three months of bank statements, make sure they're recent bank statements. Uh, then you'll, um, you know, depending on your situation, you're going to need to provide your 2020 gross receipts. So, you know, I understand a lot of folks probably may have not have filed uh, their federal tax returns, but if you have, that would be preferred uh, supporting documentation, for, you know, for the SBA uh, RRF review team. Another preferred um, supporting documentation to provide your uh, gross receipt, 2020 gross receipt information would be your point of sale reports. Um, and then another acceptable um, reporting would be uh, externally or internally prepared financial statements, uh, such as the income statements or the PL statements. And make sure that you sign them, date them, and certify them as to the accuracy uh, of those um, financial statements. Keep in mind uh, that third, you know, this you know, third option, it may delay the processing uh, window for your application. So right now what they're, you know, telling folks is, is they're looking at about a 14 day window for a normal processing time. You know, I know that the, the portal just opened up within the last, you know, few days. Um, so we're going on basically, you know, 48 hours since it's been open. So we don't have any numbers yet as far as if anybody's received funds here in Massachusetts, Not, nothing's been uh, uh, reported about that. But as soon as it does, we'll, we'll definitely let, you know, all the chambers and, and uh, the rest of our um, resource partners know about that information. And then when it comes to calculation three, again, everybody's going to be required to fill out an application tax verification, you're going to need to collect those three months of bank statements. And then when it comes to your 2020 and 2021 gross receipts, um, you'll need at least one for each year. Uh, you, you know, if that's applicable to you in this calculation, um, preferred would be your 2020 federal tax returns filed or 2020 federal tax returns prepared but not yet filed. Um, other preferred uh, uh, supporting documents would be 2020 um, point of sale reports and 2021 point of sale reports. Uh, for eligible expense documentation, again, at least one um, would be required and required appropriate supporting documentation for specific eligible expense type. So what would be preferred would be a C CPA comfort letter with accompanying um, uh, p and and balance sheet documentation. So that will help the uh, SBA provide, you know, the fastest possible review time. Um, and then other acceptable 
pieces of documentation would be, you know, again, providing those um, externally or internally prepared financial statements um, that I discussed earlier, um, and also eligible expense documentation. So whether that's invoices for your expenses, payroll documents, whatever, whatever the case may be, maybe you have a, a small business loan or a recent uh, lender loan statement, things like that. If that's what you're adding to your your calculation. Not everything is going to apply if you're not adding uh, certain expenses to the calculation. So just some continued information, depending on the type of um, entity you are, you may need to supply additional uh, information uh, that wasn't covered in those last two slides. So for applicants that are a brew pub, a tasting room, tap room, brewery, winery, distillery, or bakery, as we discussed very early on in the presentation, you're going to need to show that at least 33% of your um, gross receipts comprise of on-site sales to the public. So, so you're going to need documents providing that. So that can include, um, you, you know, your tax and trade bureau forms, state or local forms filed, or internally created reports from inventory management, sales reporting, or accounting software. So if you're a business that opened in 2020, um, the applicant's original business model should have contemplated at least 33% of gross receipts in on-site sales to the public. And then if you're an in, uh, that's that's eligible under this program. Again, you'll need to doc, uh, document evidencing that on-site sales of food and beverage to the public comprise of at least 33% of the gross receipts from uh, for 2019. And if you opened in 2020, uh, the the original business model should have contemplated at least 33% of the gross receipts in on-site sales of food and beverage to the public. Just remember, this program is for generally for for entities that provide these services to the public. And then how can you get help applying? So again, um, I'll, you know, that center hotline, you can call any eligibility concerns, maybe, um, you know, it's not clear in the program guidance or in the FAQs, which are also being updated on an hourly basis. Um, Maybe it's not clear on what specific documentation may be acceptable, or you know, you have a specific uh, question that's just not covered in any any guidance. You can call that center hotline. Also, too, you you can you know shoot um, us an email at uh, the Massachusetts District Office if you have questions that may not be you know clear you know when it comes to eligibility, or maybe you have a technical issue that you know we can try to help bring up the to the chain. You know, you can reach us at Massachusetts. DO for district office at sba.gov. Shoot us an email and we'll try to get some clarity to your question as soon as possible. And then um, also too, um, there's gonna, there is currently help in multiple languages. So if you call the center hotline, from what I understand, uh, you can select certain languages. Also too, if you go to the RRF landing page on sba.gov, um, if you just scroll to the bottom of the actual page, I think we have close to 30 language conversions um, for, for that uh, landing page and all of the supporting documentations on there. So if you just click on the language that best suits your needs, it, it should convert everything over for you. And then just some, uh, some reminders and best practices. So you wanna make sure that you provide a complete documentation. Uh, applications with incomplete documentation will be rejected. The review process will restart when complete documentation is provided. Uh, delays could jeopardize the applicants uh, receiving the award. And then also too, you wanna leverage your resources. So while it's not required, uh, the use of CPAs and other accounting professionals may help ensure a complete and well-documented application. And, you know, the thing is, I'm sure a lot of you folks have a lot of these documents that I've been discussing, you know, probably already prepared because, you know, I understand a lot of people have been applying for different grant funding and other COVID relief, um, you know, funding options, you know, throughout the entire, you know, last year, um, whether it's, you know, at the federal level with the SBA programs or at the state and local level. So, you know, um, you know, just make sure, you know, keep it going with, with this program, you know, they, they do want all up-to-date information. Uh, so the, also to application corrections. 
So the SBA is not able to make corrections on behalf of the applicant. So if you, you know, if you call someone, you know, myself or one of my colleagues at our office, we don't have access to the application portal. So we can't go in there and make any uh, corrections for you. So what you'll need to do is you'll need to contact that center hotline at 844-279-8898 and, uh, you know, ask them to see if they can make those corrections uh, for you. Unfortunately, you know, at the at the district office uh, level, they don't always give us access to the portals for, you know, whether it's PPP or whether it's this program or SVOG, um, you know, they limit our access on that end of things. Uh, so uh, also to applicants who still intend to apply for PPP, again, you know, we've already discussed that PPP has been exhausted. We will um, provide you additional updates as the day, day goes on because there may potentially be, you know, depending on your situation, um, uh, you may be able to apply for a PPP loan through, through uh, uh, CFI, but it's limited. So we're, we're in the process of trying to find out if uh, the folks who are, are identified as CFIs can uh, or are still taking applications. So, um, you know, more to come on, on that information. But again, if you if you have an open application, you want to make sure that, you know, um, that 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 was withdrawn so you can properly apply for this um, fund if that was your intention. And then when can you apply, you know, uh, you can already apply, so you can apply right now. You might be, you might be applying as I'm talking, so that's you know that that that's fine by me too. So, um, but you know, initially what what the SBA did is they selected a, a few thousand uh, participants from the um, PPP that were PPP borrowers that identified um, as uh, certain priority groups that would um, be potential priority groups for the RRF program. Um, so they did some uh you know working things out behind the scenes and the application so they've already kind of handled you know that end of things on the pilot period so but um there is a priority period that started on monday so within the first 21 days what's going to happen is um the sba will accept applications from all eligible applicants uh, but keep in mind only applications from small businesses owned by women veterans and socially and economically disadvantaged applicants will be funded during this period, okay? And then on day 22, all eligible applications will be processed and funded until the funds are exhausted. I just wanna reiterate again though, if you do not fit into a priority group, that does not mean you should wait till day 22 to apply. Apply right away. You know, they're, they're just, you know, going to, um, you know, pick the, the, the applications that came in on a first come first serve basis under the priority groups first, and then get to the rest of the applications, but you can apply right away. You do not have to wait till that day 22. Uh, so what are the priority groups? So just some additional information. So these next few slides, you know, I'll go over, you know, some of this information, but um, we also have a frequently asked question page on the RRF landing page that um, provides more in-depth uh, definitions for say like socially and economically uh, disadvantaged. It also provides links to the code of federal regulations that even further identifies uh, that. So if you need more information on that, that please go to the, uh, the landing page and I'll make sure everybody has the links for that uh, after the presentation. A small business concern. Um, so, what you know? What's the priority group? A small business concern uh, that it is at least fifty-one percent owned, and the management and daily operations of the applicant are controlled by one or more individuals who are women, veterans, or socially and economically disadvantaged. Um, applicants must self-certify on the application that they meet uh, eligibility requirements. So, there is no certification process. You know, so you know we're. we're we're hoping that you know the general public, you know, uh, uses their best judgment and, and provides you know their their honest um, you know you know self certification because there is no you know right there's no process you know during the application for you to go through a certification or you need to provide any sort of documentation that proves that. However, keep in mind these loans are these fun, funding grants uh, awards are going to be randomly audited 
throughout the entire process of this program. So, you know, that can happen at any point in time. Um, you know, an SBA reserve reserves that right. And at that point in time, they may ask if you are in a priority group for additional documentation to support, um, you, you know, that, that certification that you had at, on, on your application. So, uh, you know, just bear in mind, you know, that, that, that is going to happen just typically, you know, and that happens across the board with our other programs, whether it's PPP, SVOG, IDLE, they randomly audit, um, you know, the, these um, award awardees. Uh, also too, I just wanna give you an example, you know, cause when we talked about that 51%, needing at least 51%, it doesn't have to be from one um, owner. So, you know, just as an example, you know, you can have an applicant that has five owners, who each own 20% of the applicant, two of the owners are veterans and one of the owner is socially and economically disadvantaged individual. Uh, the SBA will consider this applicant to meet the requirement that at least 51% of the applicant is owned by a priority group. So, you know, it can be, you know, added up um, if you have multiple owners that fit, you know, within a certain, um, uh, um, um, you know, priority definition. So when it comes to the definitions of socially and economically disadvantaged, you can see, you know, this is the basic rundown of them. So for socially disadvantaged individuals are those who have been subjected to racial or ethnic prejudice or cultural bias because of their identity as a member of a group without regard to their individual qualities. Uh, individuals who are members of the following groups are presumed to be socially disadvantaged. You have your Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, so this includes Alaskan Natives and Native Hawaiians, uh, Asian Pacific Americans, or subcontinent Asian Americans. And then economically disadvantaged individuals are those socially disadvantaged individuals whose ability uh, to compete in the free enterprise system has been impaired due to diminished capital and credit opportunities as compared to others in the same business area who are not socially disadvantaged. And then uh, just you know some more information on, on this. When it comes to uh, if an entity um, reorganizes for the purpose of the qualification for the priority period, uh, that's going to um, result in an automatic disqualification of the award. So again, you know just you know use your honesty, use integrity. Don't don't try to all of a sudden, you know, reorganize your, your, your business entity for that sole purpose. Cause it's audit, you know, your application's automatically going to get, uh, you know, um, you know, disqualified in that case. And then, um, there is some set asides for this particular fund program, you know, depending on, um, um, the applicant's 2019 uh, gross receipts. So with this program, they're really trying to make sure and target, you know, the, the smallest of the small businesses and making sure that they're, you know, provided a chance to get some uh, grant award funding. So with that said, you'll, you, you'll see here on this present um, slide that 5 billion is set aside for the applicants with 2019 gross receipts of not more than 500,000. Uh, additionally, there's another 4 billion is set aside for applicants with 2019 gross receipts uh, be, um, from a little over 500,000 to 1.5 million. Uh, and then um, 500 million is set aside for applicants with 2019 gross receipts of not more than $50,000. So, you know, the SBA at the end of the day will reserve the right to reallocate these funds, you know, at the discretion of the administrator. All right. So, that is the uh, tail end of it. I know I probably, you know, have your head spinning at, the, at this point with all this information, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll make sure I provide everybody, you know, the important links um, that you need to, you know, get your application started at the end of the presentation, along with this um, PowerPoint as well. So you can, you know, go back and, and reference to it if you need, need to. But we can uh, open it up for questions. All right, Dan, we have a few um, in the chat. I'm not sure if they've been answered. Uh, let me, uh, I got to find them. Uh, Tracy Blake, I'm not sure if yours was answered. Do you have to outline during the submission how you're going to utilize the funds? So I, I think, um from what I've seen on the screenshots, they just ask you like generally 
you know, on the application, you know, what, um, you know, what, so, what are your, your actual intentions for, for use, but it's not something that they're, they're going to completely hold you to. So like, if, if, you know, if you say, oh, like I'm going to use it. With you. the travel and tourism, it looked like you had to like write pretty much a proposal for funds. Um, but it doesn't seem that way with this. So for example, if someone gets funds, I don't have to, I, I work for USA Today in, in the marketing um, element. I don't have to free write a, a marketing plan for them and then, then su submit it. They can, I can, I can write that after they've gotten their funds. Yeah, th this program, this program in general is just much easier, uh, you know, than say compared to the SVOG, we have to supply more information. This is more cut and dry. It's like, just what are your intentions, you know, as far as expenses, and, you know, that's just kind of generalized. And then they're just going to ask for reporting on that. On a Afterwards. Year so they can yeah. figure out, you know, once, once that once they've been funded, they can figure out their priorities. And because being able to use it to 2023 priorities and needs may change in that mm -hmm. time period. Yeah. Yeah. And as, as long as they just stick to eligible uh, use of funds, that's really what they're going to be checking. They're not checking, you know, what the plan is or how much you use for this versus that. Right. It's right, right. It doesn't just have to be sure like 20% can go to marketing. 30% can go to yeah, they're go not going to payroll. For like a, none of that. Yeah, breakdown on that. Okay. No, no intention of that for this. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Um, okay. Uh, Rick asked if there was any provision for veterans social clubs like VFWs and American Legions. Um, so I, I, I think they fall under nonprofits. So and nonprofits are not um, eligible. The only... Um, thing I would say to that is if the nonprofit has a restaurant that is run by a for-profit entity, so if they have like a separate entity that's for-profit and it's a restaurant in their facility, uh, they can be eligible. Just the nonprofit itself is just not eligible for this particular program. Great, thank you. Uh, Lori Driscoll is asking, uh, Dan, can you please confirm for the group, because it came up with one of her clients, that if someone purchased an existing business in 2020, mm -hmm. but have the seller's financials for 2019, they can in fact utilize the seller numbers? Yes, they, they can. If they, if they have the, the numbers from 2019, they can utilize them. And, and that was actually, I think, that question, I think Lori might have asked us that question in the office, Lori. I'm pretty sure, but uh, but I, I think that question actually got added to the RRF frequently asked questions. That specific one, um, so I, I can supply that to everybody after, just and copy and paste that over, so so folks have that to refer to it. Because there's about, I think both with technical and eligibility questions, we're looking at I think over 200. Uh, Q and A's that are now answered, and they they've been plugging away on that, and really trying to make sure everybody uh, understands those specific type of questions. Good. All right. Uh, Samantha Lawson is asking: Is there a percentage criteria for the difference between difference from 2019 and 2020 revenues that the SBA is looking for? Um, so when you, when you say difference in, in criteria, like, so, so as far as, you know, like 2020 for like gross receipts, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna remove any sort of like basically grant funding you have. I also too, I, I, um, I think like tips aren't included in gross receipts. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say that's on the FAQ I'll double check and I'll send that out. But, uh, but yeah, it, the, the definition of gross receipts is on the program guide. Um, let me just see here. So basically it's just gonna come down to whatever accounting method you use. And, you know, there's, depending on your organization, um, you know, it's basically gonna be all forms of revenue for your 2019. You know, you probably didn't, if you received grant funding for other stuff, um, you know, in 2019 before you wanna add that to your gross receipts for 2019, if that was the case. I know, you know, some cities and towns might've, provided funding for like Main Street improvements or, or whatnot, like grant funding prior to COVID, you'll add, but that should only reflect your 2019 uh, gross receipts. Anything 2020 with grant funding wouldn't, you would just exclude that. But um, it's basically, you know, all, all forms of revenue for both though, 
uh, outside of grant funding. Okay, actually, she sent something over here. Sorry, she meant what is the percentage decrease from 2019 versus 2020 to be eligible? Well, so depending on what calculation you use, mm -hmm. it, it comes down to so like if, if you are in calculation one, right, you were in operation all through 2019, if you had higher 2020 gross receipts, more than likely you're not going to be eligible for the program because it's based on the minimum award is $1,000. So if you, you had, you know, um, uh, uh, less gross receipts in 2019, more in 2020, and then you also had PPP loans, you're going to come out with a negative figure. If you come out with a negative figure, uh, it's ineligible, you know, because um, they're, they're trying to help uh, or focus on the small businesses that basically didn't do as well in 2020 versus 2019. Okay. All right. That's good. Um, any other questions? Hi, Pam. Hey, Arthur. Um, I just had a question about the, um, is the LGBT community con um, considered socially disadvantaged or are they just looking at race and ethnicity? No, I, 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 um, I want to say when I read the full definition, uh, um, LGBTQ is considered uh, socially disadvantaged. Uh, I'll send the uh, screenshot of the FAQ portion, but uh, I think the FAQ, it elaborates on it even further just because it would be like six or seven slides and realist and realistically if we gave the full definitions, but I, I want to say LGBTQ was listed in there, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Guess not. Nope. Dan, thank you as always. That was wonderful. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. And if if things come up, you know, I know sometimes, you know, after hearing me speak for an hour you know <laughs> you know your head stops spinning you have some more coffee and then oh wait i, I wanted to ask this question you know just shoot us a, an email at, at the uh, massachusetts do for district office at sba.gov and you know if, if uh, we don't have an answer to your question we'll try to bring that up the chain and, and get that answer for you as soon as possible yes and um right and you can always uh contact a uh, your specific chamber and we can get you to the right person as well. So Dan, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank uh, Marie who had to sign off and Rick, um, three chambers working together with the SBA, uh, you know, looking out for our restaurants and all the community. So we really appreciate it. I have recorded this session, so it will be on, um, on uh, YouTube, but you can email me if you're interested in it. And Dan will forward to me the presentation that I can email to all participants today and those that maybe missed it as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, Pam. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everybody. Have a good all rest right. of your day. Enjoy your margaritas tonight. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Forgot. Good reminder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we might need it now after that. Yeah. <laughs> Adios. All right. See Everybody. you later. Bye.